Today's video is going to be all about chocolate. And one reason for that is because a couple of months ago, a paper was published that showed chocolate consumption to be associated with reduced risk for all cause and cause specific mortality. So let's have a look at the data. So here we're looking at the hazard ratio for all cause mortality risk on the y axis plotted against chocolate consumption in servings per week on the x axis. And note that one serving of chocolate was defined as less than one average bar or less than one ounce, so about 28 grams. Now, the ha hazard ratio of one is where we can assess statistical significance. So when the purple, the dashed purple dotted lines, which is indicative of the 95% confidence interval, is completely below a hazard ratio of one, in this case, we have statistical significance. So what does the data show? When compared with the red arrow, people who consume no chocolate, we can see that the green arrow was the lowest all-cause mortality risk, and that was present for a little bit more than half of a serving of chocolate per week, so around 18 grams of chocolate per week. But note that for all chocolate intakes, uh, one up to eight plus servings per week, we can see that the dashed purple line is below a hazard ratio of one, which when compared with no chocolate intake, all-cause mortality risk was reduced for all chocolate intakes as high as eight plus servings per week in never smokers. So what about in smokers? So in smokers, there was a, a lesser effect where uh, it was about eight to a 9% decreased all-cause mortality risk, ACM risk, for current or firm former smokers, and with a pretty large sample size too, similar to the non-smokers, so about 47,000 subjects. But in their case, uh, it was significant for one serving of chocolate per week when compared with no servings of chocolate per week, and then higher intakes of chocolate were not associated with the reduced all-cause mortality risk in the current or former smokers. So a small amount of chocolate may be beneficial based on this data when compared with uh, not eating any chocolate. Now, cause-specific mortality was also reduced, not just all-cause mortality risk. So let's have a look at that data. So first, starting with cardiovascular disease mortality, uh, when comparing people who didn't eat any chocolate, so that uh, zero chocolate intake per week, uh, that was defined as the reference. And then when looking at higher intakes of chocolate per week, so up to half a serving, 0 to 0 0.5, uh, half a serving to one serving, one to two servings per week, and then greater than two servings per week, we can see that all intakes of chocolate above zero Regardless of the model, so the less adjusted model, model one, including more variables, model two, and then the fully adjusted model, model three, we can see that all intakes of chocolate above zero was associated with a significantly reduced cardiovascular disease mortality risk. Uh, similarly, Alzheimer's disease mortality risk was also reduced for people who consumed uh, more chocolate than none. Uh, so when compared with no chocolate intake, which was used as the reference, we can see that half a serving up to two servings uh, per day regardless of the model, model one, two, or three, was asso associated with significantly reduced Alzheimer's disease mortality risk. Now, uh, models one and two weren't significantly associated with a reduced Alzheimer's disease uh, mortality risk for people who consume more than two servings of chocolate per day, but we can see the fully adjusted model, model three, was indeed statistically significant for uh, people who consumed more than two servings of chocolate per week when compared with no chocolate per week. Also note that uh, up to half a serving per week for Alzheimer's disease mortality risk was not significantly different from people who did not consume any chocolate per week. So based on this, we can conclude that chocolate consumption is significantly associated with a reduced risk for cardiovascular and Alzheimer's disease mortality. Now, note that cancer, cerebrovascular, and respiratory mortality were not significantly associated with any intake of chocolate. So is this just related to healthy user bias? So do people who eat more chocolate than none have a healthier overall lifestyle, which is potentially explaining these effects. So to assess that, they, uh, the authors of the study examined some metrics that can be related to healthy user bias, including uh, the amount of physical activity in minutes per week, fruit and vegetable intake, and added sugar. So for in people that consume no chocolate, they actually had higher levels of physical activity and fruit and vegetable intake when compared with people who had relatively higher amounts of chocolate intake, as shown there with the red box. Similarly, people who consume no chocolate had a lower added sugar intake when compared with the uh, chocolate consumers more than two servings per week who had almost double of an added sugar intake. So from this, we can conclude that maybe healthy user bias is not involved here, that uh, chocolate consumers were less physically active, ate less fruit and vegetables, but more added sugars. So note that this study is based on associations and association doesn't equal causation. So is there, uh, is there data for an impact of chocolate on health in randomized controlled trials, RCTs. So in one of these, and there are many RCTs for chocolates, uh, uh, in uh, chocolate intakes effects on health, and I'll link to those studies below. For, so I'm just gonna go through one of these studies uh, in this video. 
So in this study, they compared people consuming 100 grams per day of dark chocolate versus 90 grams per day of white chocolate in 15 subjects for 15 days. And this was, this was in relatively young subjects that were 34 years old and had a normal weight uh, BMI of 23. So first, what was the effect on insulin sensitivity? So to assess that, they uh, looked at HOMA-IR, which is the homeostasis model assessment, and the IR stands for insulin resistance. So they compared HOMA-IR values, which are calculated based on fasting data for insulin and glucose, in people before the study started and then after the 15 days when they were consuming the 100 grams per day of dark chocolate. And then similarly, they compared HOMA-IR values before and after the study for people who were consuming white chocolate. Now note that white chocolate uh, differs from all of the other chocolates, so milk, uh, dark, bittersweet, uh, cocoa powder, cocoa beans, etc. Uh, white chocolate contains uh, cocoa butter, but no cocoa solids, which contain uh, most of the polyphenols, and that'll become important in, in a minute. So in terms of insulin sensitivity, as defined by HOMA-IR, a lower HOMA-IR value is indicative of more insulin sensitivity, and we can see in that the, the people that were consuming the dark chocolate, they had a reduction in HOMA-IR, which is an improvement in insulin sensitivity. In contrast, the people that were consuming white chocolate did not see a reduction in HOMA-IR, no reduction, uh, no improvement in insulin sensitivity. So the authors of this study, oh, uh, just, to, just as a quick blurb, so in, there was, uh, this data shows that there was improved insulin sensitivity in the dark, but not the white chocolate group. So then the authors of this study also looked at the effect of chocolate intake on blood pressure in the two different uh, groups, dark chocolate versus white chocolate. And that's what we can see here. So systolic blood pressure on the y-axis before and after, uh, 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 so not consuming, uh, so before the study started and then after dark chocolate consumption. And then similarly, we see systolic blood pressure on the y-axis here before and after white chocolate consumption. And what we can see is that in the dark chocolate consumers, there was a reduction in blood pressure for the dark chocolate group, but not in the white chocolate group. So what are some potential mechanisms for chocolate's effects on health? And one potential explanation involves the polyphenol epicatechin. So why is epicatechin important? Well, simply, it extends lifespan, at least in mice. So that's what's shown here. So in this study, epicatechin, uh, EC, uh, was administered in the drinking water to 20-month-old mice, which when considering a 40-month ma uh, maximal lifespan in mice, that's equivalent to about a 60-year-old person. So OC are the uh, old controls that were not given epicatechin compared to the EC, epicatechin. So this was a study that was a 37-week study, and then after 37 weeks, they assessed survival in epicatechin supplemented versus the old mice that were not getting, not eat, not drinking uh, epicatechin. So after 37 weeks in the uh, old controls, so no catechin, only 39% uh, of the mice were still alive. In contrast, the epicatechin supplemented mice, 70% was were still alive. And then even seven weeks after this, the 37-week study, 44% of the epicatechin mice were still alive. So we can see that lifespan extending effect of epicatechin. So uh, with that in mind, how much epicatechin is in chocolate? So this is data obtained from the USDA flavonoid database, and I'll link to that uh, in the uh, description below, video's description below. So here we're looking at um, uh, white chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, and bittersweet chocolate. So white chocolate has no epi epicatechin content, and this is in milligrams of epicatechin per 100 grams of food. Uh, milk chocolate has more, 11 uh, milligrams per 100 grams. Dark chocolate has 42 to 84 milligrams per 100 grams. And then bittersweet chocolate, is, uh, or sorry, baking chocolate, which is essentially the same thing, has 143 milligrams of epicatechin per 100 grams. But cocoa powder is the all-star here for epicatechin content. As we can see, it has 196 milligrams of epicatechin per 100 grams. Now, these are all processed. Uh, all of these versions of chocolate are the processed version of the whole food, which is cocoa beans. So to get uh, epicatechin into my diet, I grind whole co uh, cocoa beans and I mix them with dates. And uh, also note that I've tracked my dietary intake, as many of you know on this channel. Since 2015, I, I've been tracking macro and micronutrients, and I started tracking food intake in July of 2018. So with that in mind, is 18 grams of chocolate, and that should be per week, or some other amount optimal for health? And we can assess that by looking at my own N of 1 data. So how much cocoa is optimal based on my own N of 1 data? And as I mentioned, I have three plus years of uh, every day tracking my dietary intake, and over that time period, I have 17 blood tests that, cor that correspond. So this is going to be my average daily uh, cocoa bean intake versus the big picture biomarkers. And if you've seen my recent videos, 
These are biomarkers of overall systemic health, as shown here. So there are 22 uh, biomarkers, including glucose, which should be obvious for any uh, pro-longevity strategy. In recent videos, I had homocysteine here, but I only have six blood tests for homocysteine, so I didn't include it for this video. But as I have more data for homocysteine, I'll likely include it. So I've got three markers of kidney function, uh, four markers of liver function, all of the major lipoproteins. I've got a few immune cells, the major immune cells, neutrophils, lymphocytes, percentage of lymphocytes, platelets, red blood cells, and then a couple of red blood cell related measures, inflammation, including high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and then the overall biological age score when using Levine's phenotypic age and aging.ai. And note that the little n is indicative of how many blood tests that I have over this three plus year period. So what is co uh, cocoa, my average daily cocoa bean intake, associated with? Is associated with any biomarkers going in the right direction or in the wrong direction? So first, in terms of biomarkers going in the right direction, we can see that a relatively higher cocoa bean intake is associated with a lower uh, amount of AST, the liver enzyme aspartate aminotransferase, and that's potentially a good thing because my AST uh, levels can trend as high as 40, and if you've missed my AST video, value somewhere in the low 20s uh, may be optimal. So that's one biomarker going in the right direction. Uh, similarly, a higher cocoa bean intake is significantly correlated with a higher higher levels of red blood, red blood cells, and that's important because red blood cells decline during aging. Now, uh, uh, conversely, also going in the right direction though, is a higher cocoa bean intake is associated with a lower MCV. So MCV, or the mean red blood cell volume, uh, increases during aging, and relatively higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, so that they're associated with lower a lower MCV is potentially going in the right direction. So I've got three biomarkers going in the right direction in correlation with cocoa bean intake. What about going in the wrong direction? So there's only one that's signif uh, statistically significant, and that's the percentage of lymphocytes. So a relatively higher cocoa bean intake is correlated with correlated with a lower percentage of lymphocytes. And the percentage of lymphocytes declines during aging, so that's just one reason why that's going in the wrong direction. So the overall score there is plus two, three going in the right direction, one going in the wrong direction in terms of their correlation with my cocoa bean intake. But note that one of these four significant correlations, at least based on the nominal p-value, with a p-value less than 0.05, may be a false positive. And that's because by definition, when the p-value is 0.05, that means you've got one false positive for 20 measurements, and I just did 22 measurements. So it's possible that one of these will be a false positive. So to account for that, we can, uh, we can calculate the adjusted p-value. And in this uh, example, I use the benjamini hochberg, hochberg method. So that uh, helps to ask the question, what's the probability that the nominally significant p-values are false positives? So uh, in this case, when looking at the four sig statistically significant um, values based on p-values, we can see that the adjusted p-values range from 0.17 to 0.20. So there isn't really an improvement in p over p-values in this case, as there's an 80 to 83% chance uh, that these four correlations are not false positives. So uh, based on this data, it, when considering that one of them may be a false positive, at worst, the net score is plus one. So instead of having three going in the right direction, now it's two, two versus one going in the wrong direction, net plus one. But at best, I've got a net of plus three. For example, the lymph lymphocyte percentage may be a false positive, so it will be three going in the right direction, none going in the wrong direction. So when considering that the overall effect is net positive in this case, uh, cocoa bean intake is significantly correlated with a better than average effect on my uh, systemic biomarkers. Now note that if there, were, there was an equal amount of biomarkers going in the right and wrong direction, the net effect would be neutral. And conversely, if I had more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than in the right direction, that would suggest that cocoa, cocoa bean intake would have a net negative effect on my overall systemic health. So with that in mind, and based on this data, how much cocoa uh, may be optimal for me? So this is my cocoa bean intake over the past three plus years period, and each data point uh, corresponds to the average intake that corresponds to a blood test. So during this three plus year period, my average daily cocoa bean intake is 12 grams per day, but I have a pretty wide range from as low as about one gram uh, of cocoa beans per day to about 18, uh, 19 uh, grams per day. So when considering that my net score was positive, this suggests that uh, I should eat somewhere uh, from my average intake to my highest intake. If the net score was neutral, I'd eat as close to my average as possible. And if my net score was negative, I'd eat below my average intake for the next blood test. And then I would continually reassess these correlations to, to try to get as close to the truth as possible. Now note that in, in contrast with the Zhang et al. study that identified 18 grams of chocolate per week as optimal, 
my own n of one data suggests that somewhere between 12 to you know about 19 grams of cocoa beans per day not per week may be optimal all right that's all for now uh, if you're interested in more uh, in terms of my biohacking approach uh, for aging uh, you can check us out on patreon and uh, thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed the video have a great day